Hello, and welcome back to The Coin Story Show, where we get to hear from the leading voices in Bitcoin, financial markets, macro, and even beyond. This podcast does not provide financial advice. It is for educational purposes only. These episodes and interviews wouldn't be possible without my partners. So first up, OKCoin. OKCoin is one of the fastest growing and most secure global cryptocurrency exchanges where you can buy and learn about Bitcoin. OKCoin is committed to investing in educational content, funding Bitcoin and Lightning Network developers, as well as supporting crypto entrepreneurs from underrepresented groups so that we have a more diverse pool of talent that works on Bitcoin ecosystem projects and careers. OKCoin has contributed more than $1 million to core devs and counting and has one of the most active lightning nodes. I also love that you can toggle between Bitcoin and Sats mode. And if you want to get started investing, head to okcoin.com slash Natalie and get $50 in Bitcoin when you sign up. All right. Well, I'm super excited to chat with you, everybody. Dr. Jeff Ross, a doctor and a financial expert. How are you? I'm doing great, Nat. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. Thank you. Um, so I want to hear a little bit about your backstory. So you just mentioned before we started recording, you're actually from Minnesota, but you live in Colorado. That's correct. Yeah. So I grew up mostly in Minnesota. I actually moved around a lot when I was a, a kid because of my dad's work, uh, but spent most of my time in Minnesota. Uh, did my my training there for, for medicine uh, and then actually went to Wisconsin uh, for a little bit as well. Was there for about five years. And then in 2008, we moved here to Colorado Springs. So we're both Midwest kids because I grew up outside Chicago and a lot of my oh. friends went to school in either Minnesota or Wisconsin or Indiana. Um, what did your dad do that had you moving around a lot of the family? He was in retail. He was, he worked for a department store that it doesn't exist anymore because they were bought out by Saks uh, around the, oh. the turn of the millennium. So it was called Herbergers. Uh, so he worked his way up. He actually worked. He was a window dresser to start, basically. And then he worked all the way up and he became the president of Herbergers. Um, wow. And then he, and then he was on board when it when it got sold to Saks back around. The, it was in the late 90s sometime. Isn't it amazing how before I feel like people would stay with one company for decades and they would work their way up from, I think even, you know, in, in the Disney corporation, uh, Bob Iger started in the parks or something and made his way to CEO. But today people are flipping jobs a lot, aren't they? Oh, it's very different for sure. Yeah. It's just such a different mentality. And that's what we all, you probably grew up the same way as you, once you start something, you don't quit, right? You, you, you're with it. And that's what my parents taught me. That's what they learned from their parents. It is not the same anymore at all. People are flipping jobs, you know, uh, every couple of weeks, every month, every year. Uh, so yeah, there's not really a company or a corporate loyalty anymore. Uh, it's, it's just a, it's a different world for sure. Well, back then, corporate loyalty probably had something to do with the fact that you could actually afford to live and be loyal to the company as opposed right. to now. Why would you? I feel like a lot of people just get frustrated that the CEO is making this much, everybody else is making this much, and there is, why, why would you feel loyal, right? Right, um, right. Well, so what was your upbringing like? And did you want to become a doctor because you had this feeling like, I want, I, you, I love biology, I want to contribute to to help people be healthy or was it money related or maybe a little bit of both? Yeah, well, I definitely didn't do it for the money. Uh, um, I, I just really enjoyed, well, let's see. So going back to college. So in college, I, I loved both finance and investing and medicine. And I had to decide between which one of those two paths I wanted to go down. Um, so I obviously chose pre-med. Um, I, what I love about medicine, and it gets a bad rap these days, especially from kind of the alternative medicine side of things, and, and because I think the healthcare system is very sick, and it's broken, and it needs to change, and we can talk about that if we want to, but um, what I love about it is it's just really smart, good people trying really hard to help people be the healthiest versions of themselves. So they're like dedicating their lives to helping people, and when they're in trauma, and when they have cancer, and when they have whatever condition that they're using their brain power, they're really giving up a lot of their lives. Like they have a lot of doctors have pretty low quality of lives, even though they make a lot of money. Um, they're spending, you know, like when I was working, I was on call every fourth night, I used to get up and work nights all the time, uh, and then and then get up again and work during the day. Um, and so it's a tough, it's tough on your family, it's tough on your marriage, um, it's tough on friendships, you kind of are married to medicine. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's just a tough decision to make. So my heart really goes out to a lot of physicians. I think a lot of physicians get to this, they get out into practice and they feel stuck. They feel trapped in this system, like they're cogs in this system that you basically are forced to do what the system tells you to do, even if you don't necessarily agree with it. You either 
comply and you get paid well for it, but you're kind of unhappy or you try to fight it and you lose your privileges and you get kind of booted out of the system. And, and it's kind of down to that now, it's either this or this, and neither of those options are very good for physicians. So I think that's why we're seeing a lot of physician burnout. There's a lot uh, fewer people going into medical school these days. There, I, there's you know a, a doctor shortage already. There's a healthcare worker shortage in general. Uh, and I think all of that gets worse before it gets better, unfortunately. When you say that doctors have to comply with something, what do you mean by that? What do they have to comply with? You have to, um, I mean, it's, it's really basic and most patients don't really know this kind of thing, but if you come in as a patient to see a doctor, we have to ask you X amount of questions in order to get to, for the coding to the billing to work out correctly. So you have your program and you have to check, you know, six out of eight boxes. Did you ask this? Did you ask this? Did you ask this? Whether or not it's relevant. Uh, and, and that's kind of frustrating for a physician to sort of be directed on what to do instead of doing what he or she thinks is the best for their patient. Um, and if you don't do that, you can, you can literally lose your privileges if you don't comply. Like, you know, and, there, and then this COVID thing was a whole nother issue. You either get vaccinated or you don't. And if you do, you, you'll lose your privileges if you decide to not get vaccinated. Um, there are lots of things like that. So that's just kind of very uh, prevalent throughout all of healthcare. It's led to a lot of physician and healthcare worker unhappiness in general. Well, I want to ask you a little bit more, but maybe we'll save it for the uh, later half of this episode because I almost was pre-med as well. I was deciding Funny. between media and pre-med because my mom was always interested in health growing up and and my family's European. We came and just everything was different with regards to like how I saw my friends and peers living and their lifestyle and the food that they would eat and and how much they would even trust you know, a doctor, what, what is approved by the FDA versus my family who was always skeptical. And, uh, you mm -hmm, know, they come from mm -hmm. a communist background and they were always skeptical about everything. <laughs> but um, it's funny too, because my mom would always talk about how in Poland, a doctor wouldn't make that much more than a teacher. And here in the U S you could be making, I mean, you can make a lot of money yep. and sometimes mm -hmm. it's because you're that specialized and you're that great, but also sometimes it's because of how much you prescribe and you get kickbacks. Right. So she always thought that here in the U S she was disappointed that a lot of people seem to be going into medicine for the financial aspect of it, as opposed to really feeling this calling to help people and to be that service provider. Um, but we can, I guess, talk about that a little more later. So sure. you went into radiology, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why radiology? So radiology and, and then I also, my, my fellowship was something called interventional radiology, which is kind of the surgical side of radiology. So you do uh, minimally invasive uh, image guided procedures. So I was the kind of, I was the guy that stuck catheters into people. And if somebody needed to have dialysis, I would put a catheter in. If you need chemotherapy, you put a chest port in. Uh, I did that. I treated a lot of tumors where say you have a, a tumor in your liver or on your kidney, I would put a little probe uh, through a tiny little incision in your back, a little probe into the body and you either burn or freeze the tumor. Uh, so you can go home the same day instead of having a major surgery where you take half your kidney or your whole kidney out, things like that. We did a lot of really cool things like that. Sorry, look why like were you, you yeah. Why were you interested in that kind of medicine? Um, I, well, first of all, radiology is really cool. It's like the most technological side of medicine. So all of the advancements in the last uh, several decades, a lot of those have come through the radiology side. So cats, the fact that you can see inside of a person's body, and it used to be really based on, you know, you'd go see a doctor in the traditional sense 50 years ago, they would do, you know, they'd get your history, they'd do a real thorough physical exam, and then they'd come up with kind of their best guess of what they thought it was. And they were usually right, but sometimes they weren't. Now, when you get a CT scan or an MRI or ultrasound or whatever, you actually just know what's going on. You say, oh, yes, it is appendicitis or no, it, it looked like appendicitis, but it's actually, uh, you know, it's your gallbladder. You have, you have cholelithiasis and cholecystitis or whatever condition. And you, you just know the answer now. And so what I liked about radiology in general is I, I had the ability to sort of be a consultant or a helper to all doctors across all specialties. So I got to sort of have my hands in everything. Like I was helping the OBGYNs talk about, you know, is this pregnancy viable and, and, and what's going on here? And then you go talk to a neurosurgeon about this brain tumor and, and those kind of things. Wow. And then talk to a sports medicine doctor about, you know, how bad is the arthritis? Do they need to get a knee replacement? Those kind of things. So that was fun. And then the surgical side, again, I kind of wore two hats in medicine. The, the interventional radiology side is doing these surgeries and these sort of things. 
I had a, a, that helped me stay uh, in touch with the patient. I had a, did a lot of patient care. Uh, I just really enjoyed doing procedures that would improve somebody's quality of life for very minimal uh, pain, uh, minimal time. You know, I could I could do something that would normally require a major surgery, but they would only, like I said, they'd be in the hospital for a day and then they'd go home on some minor pain medications, uh, and their cancer would be gone. You know, or oh, wow. uh, you know, that's uh, that's a you know that doesn't happen all the time. But those kind of things just are, are fun to do. I like to do things where I feel like I'm being very effective. Mm -hmm. I've never been a big fan of just prescribing drugs for patients. In fact, I right. always tried to get them off of their medications uh, and I was kind of a minimalist and helped them to lead a healthier life. So all of that was a lot of fun for me. I really enjoyed my whole career in medicine. I feel like you'd be a very good doctor with really good oh, bedside manner. So um, thank you. What about the investing side? So you were really interested in investing and I'm assuming that you probably, did you take out loans? Cause medical school could get pretty expensive. So did you have money to invest or were you just interested in that, that industry? So we definitely had no money in med school. I got married my right after my first year of medicine and uh, out of med school. And my wife was a teacher. So she helped me pay for medicine. We kind of worked through it together. We were literally in just total poverty for about 10 years. Um, uh, we had some family help to help buy a house for our residency to put a down payment on a house. So we had a house to live in, which was nice. And then when we sold it, we made a little money on it, uh, right before everything crashed in 2008, we sold. Um, so, so we were doing okay financially. Um, but like when I say, okay, we had zero money. We also had three kids during that time during residency wow. and fellowship. Um, so oh, wow. we were, yeah, we were struggling. It was intense and it was hard on my wife and it was hard on me. Um, but it was fun and we wouldn't change, wouldn't change anything, but yeah, we came out. So when I got out of training and moved to Colorado Springs in 2008, we basically were completely starting from scratch. We do, we weren't in debt. Like today people are in debt, 200, $300,000 or so. Uh, we also didn't buy anything. we just lived really simply, right? That, that's how maybe it's our Midwestern upbringing. If you don't have money, you don't spend money. You just tighten your belt mm -hmm. and you, 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 you eat ramen and potatoes or something for for a few years until you can make it and so that's just what we did and uh and it was fine but so were you studying investing or or how did that aspect of your of your work come about yeah, I basically forgot, to be honest, forgot about all of investing uh, in finance while I was in training because it's so intense. So med school and then residency is even more intense uh, and you don't ever sleep or anything like that. Plus, we had no money to invest anyways. And so it wasn't until I got out again of training in 2008 and I kind of got established as a private practice physician um, where I was like, oh, yeah, I, I like investing. I miss investing. And now I have some money. I have income coming in so I can finally start to invest on my own. So it was about a year after. After I got out of uh, out of my training, I started a blog uh, teaching people how to invest on their own. Back when blogs were cool, I had a blog, uh, and I just was like, "Hey, you don't need an advisor. I'll teach you how to do it myself." And so I started doing that. And um, well, how did you know how to do it to teach people? I've just always been interested in it. You know, when I was a kid growing up, my mom always had uh, on the radio, we had these programs that would teach people just kind of like, you know, good habit, good financial habits. Like you always save more than you spend, you know, make sure to invest what you had. And it was real basic stuff, like put your money in kind of mutual funds sort of things, mm -hmm. or um, just be conservative. But, but the main thing is just learn how to save, like work hard, save, don't spend more than you make. And that, so I kind of was grounded on those things. And then I got into investing just on the side. Um, because that that's just where my brain goes. I've always been into like the whole idea of compounding, right? And if I can start compounding at an early age and do that for decades and decades, I'll do fine uh, financially and do well for my family. Well, how did you pick up that knowledge? Because I feel like financial literacy in schools and in this country is really lacking. And that's one of the reasons why I think people don't understand Bitcoin because they don't understand our financial system. So how did you get that knowledge? Did you have to seek it out yourself? Did your parents teach you and instill that? My parents weren't big into investing. I, I basically am self-taught in that originally. So I just started signing up for newsletters and things that I felt like had good analysis, uh, where I felt like they were being truthful and they weren't trying to sell me anything. So I just started subscribing to newsletters basically and, and kind of taught myself along the way. We can go further down the story, but it, it wasn't until 2017 through 2019, I actually went back and got my MBA in finance, did the, you know, what you're supposed to do, um, which wasn't all that helpful to be honest at the time but it was mostly self-taught. And then another thing that was really helpful, and this is kind of what I counsel people who ask me, I have, a, there's a lot of doctors who ask me how I got to where I am and how they could do that. 
one thing I recommend is writing for it. So I got picked up by the Motley Fool. I was an analyst for them and started writing kind of healthcare and technology advisory articles and then Seeking Alpha as well. And there's there's no better way to learn than to put your content out into the world and mm-hmm. let the world evaluate you and tell you what you're doing yeah. right, tell you what you're doing wrong. You know, you got to uh, okay. kick some people out. Some people are just cruel and mean just because that's their personality. Um, but a lot of people will tell you like, hey, you got this right, but this isn't right. I don't like the way you did this. And so you learn and grow. And that's just kind of what I did. And I just made lots of mistakes and, and learned along the way. That's the, I agree. That's the best way to learn. Put it out mm-hmm. there and see if there's a, there's people find value in it and there's a need. Yep. Um, well, so in your, in your research and in your investing, did you think about the concept of money, hard money, you know, the fact that they were printing so much and whether we had inflation, that was actually what they were reporting. Um, I mean, did you come across any of that until Bitcoin? Well, yeah, I was actually kind of a gold bug back then, back before I knew Bitcoin, I I was into gold for the reasons why I love Bitcoin today. I liked gold back then, uh, right? Because gold, and I always like to give gold credit for thousands of years, it has been a fantastic stable store of value. So it's been the best alternative for humans during the entire analog age, which I just basically say anything before, you know, Bitcoin. Um, But now we live in a digital age and it wasn't until we got to the digital age that we were able to actually perfect money. So you couldn't make a more perfect form of money than gold, uh, I would say, until until we got into this digital age. So all the things we like about a gold, Bitcoin does that, but it does it 10x or 100x better, you know, and it, it doesn't only transport or it doesn't only preserve your purchasing power over time like gold does it it also does it over space so you can send bitcoin you know to africa right now for you know in one second for three cents or or, you know probably a fraction of a penny uh on the lightning network and gold can't do that you can't send you know the value of your purchasing power in gold over there because you have to pay the cost you have to pay for security you know you could lose it all these different things so that's what i love about bitcoin it was finally able to uh do uh to meet the limitations and exceed the limitations of gold so yes i was into sound money Once I became a Bitcoin fanatic, which was basically the beginning of 2019, uh, I had dabbled in it all the way back in 2016. So I like to say I was the class of 2016, but then I got held back to 2019 uh, because I wasn't bright enough. I got into crypto and all that other garbage. But once I figured it out, I actually used to have a lot of gold and silver and I sold all of that and bought Bitcoin with it. Wow. Okay. Wait, so how did you first hear about Bitcoin back in 2016 and why weren't you all in at that point? Just all my newsletters and things that I used to listen to, like, hey, there's this new technology that seems to be catching on sort of, and it could be kind of this, it's this new form of money. So I did, I, I used to buy it and I, and I, I, I kick myself, right? I, I was this rich doctor back then making a lot of money and I dabbled in Bitcoin. But then I was like, like I see people doing today and I, I try to warn people today because I've been through it myself. You see crypto and you see these bright flashing lights over here and you're like, well, I could make... 10x in Bitcoin, but I could make a thousand X if I picked the next dog coin, right? Or, you know, back then it was Litecoin and it was, you know, there was BSV and, you know, Litecoin was the silver to Bitcoin's gold and Ethereum and then all these other kind of projects. And so at the time, this is, mind you, this is before there was a, like a, so I'm big onto Twitter, right? I love Twitter and the whole FinTwit community and the Bitcoin Twitter. That didn't exist to the same extent at all uh, way back then in 2016. I had no idea. I didn't have any sort of community to talk about Bitcoin with. I knew none of my friends were into it, no family members. They just thought I was crazy because I was kind of into this crypto stuff. I didn't know what was going to win. And so when the block size wars came about, I just like, well, I'll take a basket approach. And I just had like, I own some Bitcoin and I own some Ethereum and I own some Litecoin and some BSV and Bitcoin Cash. And I just kind of went down the line and like, I don't know what's going to win. And I heard people arguing about block size and I could see their point. And I'm like, well, a bigger block side would help with transactions. But then I get their point too, that, well, if you want to preserve it and make it so um, it's a smaller block size so that more people can run nodes and it keeps it more decentralized. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good point too. And honestly, I, and, and I was so busy with work. I was just like, I don't know what's going to win. I'm just going to kind of own all of them. The funny story with this is, and I like to teach people my, my life lessons to learn from my mistakes. Back then, if you remember, you couldn't, you, everything was paired with Bitcoin. Like the, this was kind of before the stable coins were around. So you had to basically sell Bitcoin to buy Ethereum, sell Bitcoin to buy Litecoin. So by the end of 2017, I had sold all of my Bitcoin and I was all into these cryptos and they were doing great, right? If you remember that, they were going like this and then, and then they all crashed down. So here's oh, 2018. No. 
all of the cryptos went down 90 to 99 percent. ICE had made some gains, so I got hit with this huge tax bill in, in 2018 for my 2017 gains that I had made, and mostly in Bitcoin. And then I was left with zero Bitcoin, zero Bitcoin, huge tax bill, and 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 altcoins that had dropped 90 to 99 percent. And I was like, man, that was stupid. I did. By the way, I like to always tell people this. This had nothing to do with Veilshire. This was not for my Veilshire clients. This was me personally doing this kind of stuff on the side. I, had, I wasn't doing any of that in Veilshire. So that was a huge lesson learned. And I, you know, it was sort of the school of stupid. It was the tuition I paid um, to learn about things. And then um, early 2019, I finally I noticed, you know, Bitcoin's still sticking around. I should really study this and go in depth. Um, what did it for me was Safedine's book, right? The, the Bitcoin standard. Uh, I went down the rabbit hole, finally understood why it's so special, why it's basically the culmination of all of monetary history. It's the apex money, the king of money, uh, king of assets. And um and then I've, I haven't been the same ever since. Wow, that's really, that's inspiring and incredible. Does that mean that you weren't able to purchase back as much Bitcoin as you had prior to when all the altcoins fell? I, I purchased it at a much higher price. That was my cost, right? We oh. all get the price we deserve. I, I had the opportunity to load up at $500 a, a Bitcoin uh, and I would have been set, you know, for life, but hey, we all learned. So, so that's okay. I think it's a really important message because just in the last year with the run up to 60,000, I mean, a lot of people got in for the first time, right? They felt FOMO. Maybe they finally understood how bad the money printing situation was in response to the pandemic. And so they were starting to pile in and I'll be honest. I mean, I, I threw in a couple piles of, you know, hundreds or a little bit more here and there as it ran up to 60,000. And then you're like, oh my God, I could have had twice as much or three times as much. And it's, right. it's mentally challenging to feel like, oh man, I bought at the wrong time. But at the same time, one day when it goes to 100, 200, that'll still be a great investment. Yeah. You got to not psych yourself out too much, right? I agree. And I, I, I totally believe that you're never too late uh, to Bitcoin. I, I, I absolutely agree with Michael Saylor that it's, it's going up forever, Laura, right? And it will. It will just go up throughout our entire lifetimes and beyond our lifetimes. And so you're never too late. So you got to not let that, the fact that you could have been in and kicking yourself and I should have gotten in when my friend told me about it. Don't let that hold you back. You just got to start getting into it and just start buying into it because it will increase over time. I'm just like 100% certain of that. I can't say that from, from my financial stuff, not investment advice, by the way, this is just me talking. Um, but I very, I very much believe that it's going to go up forever and it will be just because of its monetary policy and properties, it's designed to appreciate indefinitely. Uh, and so it, you're never too late to Bitcoin. So if you, if you miss the boat before, just get on the next boat and you'll be fine. That's right. Well, Michael Saylor's in the, the boat of people buying at like the 50 range as well. So yep, yep. The, if a billionaire can sit on that kind of temporary loss right now, then I think we can too. Absolutely. Um, well, so why did you decide to go get your MBA? Did you feel like you were a little bit burnt out and you wanted to leave medicine entirely and just go down a different path? That must have been a hard decision. I knew I was going to leave medicine at some point. So when I, I founded Veilshire back in 2013, I had been thinking about it and planning it uh, since like early 2012, founded it in 2013, started operating, started my hedge fund operations in 2014, the beginning of 2014, started separately managed accounts, the RIA side of the business in late of 20, uh, late 2014. So I always knew I was going to sort of phase out of medicine. This was going to be my side gig. Um, and uh, so that was my plan starting out. Along the way, one of the things I noticed, so a couple of things, first of all, it was really hard for me to give up medicine because so much, especially in our culture, doctors are it, it, not, not all around, but doctors in general kind of emulated, right? I mean, you, you, we make a lot of money. Uh, people think we're smart and we do, we're, we're sort of good people in general. So, so there's a lot of prestige in being a doctor. And that was hard for me. It was hard for me to, to just give that up and to be like, okay, that's not who I am anymore. Now I'm, I'm a financial guy and financial people are, they kind of, they're sort of maligned, right? They're kind of sort of a little, maybe around where lawyers are like, we need them, but uh, you know, people feel have mixed feelings about them. And so that was tough for me. Um, so that was part of it. Um, why I went back and got my MBA, a couple of things. One, just because it was fun. Uh, and I just really enjoyed going back and learning. I thought I would learn some tidbits about like how to run my business better, maybe how to be a better investor. I will tell you that everything I learned about investing uh, on the academic side is just not, not true. It doesn't work very well. There's a lot of academic models that I think are just 
completely ridiculous. They work in academia, uh, but not in the real world. And so we had a lot of, so that was fun though, because I got to talk about it with my professors and debate those kind of things. Um, another reason was because when I was um, just a doctor, but running a hedge fund and, and running an RIA, uh, a lot of people would kind of poke fun at me like, oh, doctors are terrible investors. Why would I entrust a doctor um, you know, to my money, to manage my money, those kind of things. And so part of it was just going back and being like, I'll prove to you that I know what I'm doing and I can get an MBA and I can do it in finance and I understand finance, but just sort of to prove to the world, I wanted to have that MB, uh, MBA, you know? So it was kind of pride based a little bit, but also just to add validity to me as, Hey, I'm running this financial business now. And I'm not just, I'm, it's not just some, um, Right. fly by night kind of thing. I'm not going to just do this and then fail and crash and burn and take people down with me. Like I'm doing this. This is my job. This is my phase two career. I'm going to be doing this until I die, hopefully. Um, so that was a, that was a part of it as well. If you would, if you could go back, would you do the MBA again or no? Uh, I'm glad I did it. I, but it was, I don't like to talk poorly of it because for some people, I think it really helps. I didn't feel like I learned hardly anything as far as how to run my business better or how to be a better investor. It did give me a more broad appreciation of all uh, facets of what goes into business. I didn't know anything about operations from that. So it was fun to learn about those kind of things. I, I was, I'm a terrible salesperson. I'm not good at marketing. Uh, so taking those kind of classes was fun. That sort of helped expand me and expand my horizon and helped me appreciate what these people do, what I kind of take for granted. Um, so it gave me an appreciation. Would I do it again? That's a tough question. I'm glad I did it. I, I wouldn't, I, I don't know. I don't even know how to answer that. I'm glad I did it. That's interesting. <laughs> well, I got a master's in journalism and I tell everyone, don't go get your master's in journalism. <laughs> like go get the work experience. So much yes. more valuable, way cheaper. Yes. Um, my, my mom is very proud that I have a master's, but I definitely should have skipped over that, but yep. oh well, too uh, late. Yeah. I can relate. <laughs> Okay, so um, you mentioned Saifedean's book. How, what else provided you with sort of the knowledge to say, hey, it's going to be Bitcoin. I have so much conviction in it that I'm actually going to sell my gold. I'm not going to even diversify with that. I'm going to sell my other crypto. What, what sort of things led you really deep down the rabbit hole that might help other people? Tons of it be, uh, came from what I had already been thinking about anyways, about, you know, I, I, I've been saying for years and years that we're sort of in the final days of this Keynesian economic experiment. Like this was, this was a, a it worked well while it worked well, but it's going to be an absolute disaster when it collapses. And I think everybody knew, that. even the people who originally kind of start, started it, this credit-based system. And then when we came off the gold standard in 1971, when you just go to a pure fiat system, it's just designed to fail eventually. So people try to milk it for all they can and get all the benefits they can uh, from it uh, while they're available. But at some time, somebody has to pay the bill and somebody has to pay the price. So I'm, you know, I'm 47. I'm, I've been watching politicians kick the can down the road cycle after cycle, you know, and, and, and always blaming the people behind them and never taking responsibility, always having this short term thinking, all of these things that the fiat system, um, uh, all the destruction that it leads to all of the short termism, all of the way it leaves the world worse than we found it. I hate all of that. Like I want the world to be better for the future generations. I want my kids to have a better world, not a worse world. And so all of that just kind of led me to, there has to be some kind of alternative. And I was always kind of um, okay with gold, but, uh, but it wasn't a great alternative. I'm like, well, we've tried that before. We already were on a gold standard and then we came off a gold standard. So like, I couldn't disagree with Peter Schiff more um, that he thinks we're going back onto it, you know, and, and I wish him well, uh, but he's just wrong, right? He's not, he, he's, he's selling his book and, that, and that's fine. You got to you sell your book, um, but there's no way we're going back on a gold standard. And if we do, it will be very short lived and temporary. And so I was sort of primed for, I want to see a hard sound money. I want to see something that actually can make the world better. I want something that can force politicians to think long-term and to have an honest unit of account. And that doesn't benefit the people closest to the money printer and screw everybody else. You know, this income inequality, like this is all going to come down, come crashing down at some point. And up until I discovered Bitcoin, I didn't know what the answer was. Uh, and so I was just kind of ready for Bitcoin when I finally took, uh, went down the rabbit hole and learned about it. Then I was ready to kind of embrace it and accept it and, and even help promote the agenda of Bitcoin. Do you find yourself having to teach your hedge fund customers and clients about this? Because I would imagine if you even bring up something like Bitcoin, they probably are like, no, you know, stocks and 
uh, the more traditional path of how in, people have been investing in assets for a long time. Yes, so I'd, especially my original clients. So my original clients came to me because I was a stock picking guy who did healthcare and technology stocks. Like I was a value investor, mostly like a Warren Buffett kind of guy, Preston Pish. Like I, I used to listen to his kind of things a lot. I actually went down the rabbit hole on the journey with Preston. So I have, uh, I, I thank him all the time for that because he oh. took me along and I went from, you know, being a Warren Buffett value guy to, oh, he's interested in Bitcoin. I should probably learn more about this as well. Wow. So I kind of went alongside Preston as he did that. So, which was cool. So kudos to Preston. Um, um, yes, my original clients were like, what is this? You know, the government says it's terrible. It's used for criminal activities. It's terrible for the environment. And, and so I spent basically from early 2019 on, I've been writing to my clients like, hey, just so you know, I just want to share my thoughts with Bitcoin about it. I, I originally was able to talk a small minority of my clients to allow me to put them into some Bitcoin. And then the best part after that, so I had them in starting in 2019 and then through kind of the end of 2020, I could show my Veilshire clients, I could say, here's a Veilshire client portfolio on Bitcoin with just like a small allocation. Here's a Veilshire client with the, everything exactly the same, but with no Bitcoin. And they were so concerned about the volatility. They were concerned it was just going to, you know, make their, their life savings go down to zero. I could show them like, look, this is clearly doing much better with a little bit of Bitcoin. It's not more volatile. It kind of evens out with the other assets in here. And so I liken it to the commercial. I don't know if you remember this from back in the day. I think it was in the 80s. They used to say, this is your brain. They'd show it, they'd, they'd crack an egg and then they'd fry uh -huh. the egg. And this is your brain on drugs. Yeah. Right? And I'd say, so this is your, your portfolio. This is your portfolio on Bitcoin. Look at the difference. And then I could just have objective data to show them. And as we went along and as I kept teaching about them, uh, just being better money, right? And it's not as crazy as it sounds and, and, and dispelling the myths that you read in the headlines more and more of them came uh, came aboard. And now the vast majority of my clients, I have, um, I hold Bitcoin for them. We're gonna take a quick break from the show to hear from these sponsors. First up, Bitcoin 2023. That's right, plans are already underway for the biggest Bitcoin conference in the world. It's gonna be held in Miami next year, next May, and you can get your ticket with 10% off using the code HODL, H-O-D-L. This is gonna be an incredible event. It grows in size and scale every single year. Take a look at this video from last year where you can see amazing speakers like Michael Saylor, Jack Maulers, Kathy Wood. I was so grateful I got to anchor Bitcoin Magazine's live desk at Bitcoin 2022 and hear from some of the most brilliant minds in the space. You can network with companies, other Bitcoiners from around the world, and the parties and events going on in Miami Beach are pretty amazing as well. And if you don't wanna wait until May, I understand. How about Bitcoin Amsterdam? That's gonna be held this October. It's gonna be the first big Bitcoin conference in Europe, and you can get your ticket at b.tc slash conference for either Bitcoin Amsterdam or Bitcoin Miami 2023. Again, use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off your pass. And this episode is also brought to you by Fold. How would you like to earn Bitcoin on every single purchase and spin a fun wheel so that you can earn sats every single day? Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. Whether you're shopping at Amazon or grocery store or anywhere that you go, you can earn Bitcoin on every single thing you buy with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card. And you can spin the daily wheel, which is super fun to earn more free Bitcoin. And people have actually walked away with one whole coin on this thing. Head to foldapp.com slash Natalie and get 5,000 sats when you sign up. Now back to the show. How does it work though? Because I thought that in the RIA world, you couldn't necessarily advise people to, to have Bitcoin or buy Bitcoin. And, and as far as allocation, are you limited in terms of how much you can recommend for, for Bitcoin? So the benefit of being me is that I'm, I'm an independent advisor. I don't work for anybody. So like, I don't have a uh, Schwab or, you know, whoever, uh, Edward Jones or some company over me telling me what I can and can't do. I'm taking a risk as a, from, from a career perspective, right? People can say, you're crazy. I don't like what you do. Um, Bitcoin is too risky. I'm out. And I did lose some clients uh, because of that. They just said, I don't want to have anything to do with Bitcoin. I'm out. I'm like, okay. Yeah, I just don't care. Um, that's your choice. You know, it's your money. It's your choice. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, if you give it to me to manage, I'm going to do it to the best of my abilities. But if not, um, I, you just got to trust me that I'm doing what's best for you. Uh, I'm doing, I'm doing the same thing with my own money and my own family's money that I'm doing for you. And so it either works or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, we're going to learn from it and we're going to keep getting better. Um, and so that's how I've been. I don't have, um, nobody can fire me if I'm wrong. My clients can leave, but I don't have a boss over me telling me what I can and can't do. 
but industry wide, are there limitations? Like, are are there, are there reasons that maybe other hedge funds, the the Charles Schwab's and some of the big big banks, they can't basically say, hey, I'm going to offer this to you. For them, it's more still because it's still not regulated by the, like the SEC is still balking at the spot Bitcoin ETF, right? And so it's still not officially approved by, by the powers that be. So until it does these major institutions, it still is um, kind of a career risk for them. And the individual advisors, and I've talked to lots of them, hundreds of them that are secret pro Bitcoiners, but they can't put their clients in there. They can't because because they're risking their job and their bosses just won't let them do that. So it's a different scenario. So the so the massive amount of institutional investing, the RAs, they cannot do it yet. They still can't get their clients into Bitcoin for the reasons you're bringing up. Independent advisors like me, we can do what we want. And so um, that's that's the appeal and the, it, it's the good and the bad of working with somebody like me. Got it. Okay. So given the macro environment right now, someone comes in has. I don't know, let's say they have a million dollars and they say, how much of this should I put into Bitcoin versus real estate versus stocks? Like, how would you advise them? I always tell people that the more you know and understand Bitcoin, the more you own Bitcoin. So when you, and I, and I, I talk about four stages of understanding Bitcoin. Uh, stage one is skepticism. Stage two is speculation. Stage three is kind of uh, investing and you see it as a hedge uh, for your portfolio. And then stage four is you see it as savings technology. You see it as better money for the world. Um, and so it, I, you got to you got to figure out where you are. Obviously, if you're in the I don't get it, you're mocking it. Uh, you know, the, spec, the skepticism stage, you're not going to own any. But I try to get people to just get at least get one percent. So if, you, if you're to the this, at least the speculation stage two. Um, stage, put 1% of your net worth in there. Like even if it goes to zero, it's not going to wreck you. You'll recover from that. You'll be okay. Um, but the more people understand it and the more you understand that, yes, it's volatile, but besides the volatility and the fact that we don't know tomorrow's price action for Bitcoin, we know everything else about Bitcoin, right? We know that uh, new new blocks are going to come out like every 10 minutes. We know that there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin and some of them have been lost. We know all of these things. We know about the monetary policy. We know because it's proof of work and it's decentralized that none of this stuff is going to change. It's basically immutable. Um, we know all of that. So you can have confidence. You can take confidence in that. And then if you know that and you believe that and you believe where it's going because it's on the S-shaped curve of adoption and we're way down here right now, um, that when we get up to here, the price of it is very likely to be much, much higher than it is today. So if you kind of know all that or you're very confident in knowing that, you can increase your allocation to it. So all that said, I have clients that uh, you know two years ago, it just killed them to go from zero to 1%. And now they're up to like 40%. 50%, you know, and, and I have clients that they finally get Bitcoin and I'm like, you don't need me anymore. Go off on your own now and get your Bitcoin. Here's how you buy Bitcoin. You know, I tell them about Swan. I tell them about Strike. Put it on, a, put it in a cold storage, you know, be your own bank, all those kind of things. And like, you've moved on from Valeshire. You've moved on from me. It's like my kids, like, I'm so proud of you. You can buy this on your own. Um, and so uh, that's that's my goal. My goal is to put myself out of business, put Valeshire out of business because we've moved on to a, just a complete Bitcoin standard world. That's amazing. I love that. So I'm assuming if I handed you a million dollars, you'd put it all into Bitcoin. You wouldn't put, you wouldn't have like maybe some cash, some gold, some stocks, some real estate, all so, Bitcoin. No, no. So no, because well, it depends. First of all, I'd say you don't need me. Just 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 own Bitcoin. That's all you need. But if you still want to invest in things like stocks and bonds and commodities, those kind of things, like I have a whole trading system that I use for those kind of things. So like in my fund and in my client accounts, we still hold like uh, about it depends. It depends on what's going on. And sometimes we're long and sometimes we're short things, depending on the markets. And we can talk about macro stuff, too. I'm very bearish right now. So right now we're very we're shorting equities. We're shorting tech stocks. So the stocks I love tech growth, innovation, we're very short that right now we're betting against them um uh, we hedge against things like my my clients they they love me but but they don't want to see their accounts like when bitcoin goes from sixty nine thousand to to seventeen thousand they don't want their portfolios to go down 70 percent as much as they love me and they love bitcoin they want me to hedge against that so that they don't see 70 percent declines and so i'm hedging uh on their behalf we move to cash uh when i think things are ugly we get very defensive in our portfolios we try to make money kind of in any environment that we're in so i still love stocks i still Still love investing in great companies. Um, I'm really anti bonds. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm with Greg Foss that it's the worst mm -hmm. investment you could possibly make for the next uh, decade, probably. Um, but 
there are periods where it's actually smart to own bonds. Like if we go into a recession, people pile into US dollars and they pile into US treasuries, long dated treasuries, so they can actually make good short term investments. So those kind of things are what I do in Valshire for my clients. I kind of trade around, I actively manage the accounts uh, in hopes of making profits in whatever scenario we're in. Okay, so I want to talk about macro a little bit because now you're Dr. Bear, right? So yep. a lot of people thought that we maybe are coming out of this. Maybe I think it's a short term rally that we had just before, but a lot of people that I've spoken to say that the bottom's not in, it's going to come tumbling down, something in the system's going to break, and it'll be more of a, a quick bottom, right? We have It's not going to just pound around at the 17,000 range. It's going to be a true bottom. So what do you think about what's happening? What's going to break? I, I know timing's probably really difficult to try to figure out, but why are you a bear right now? Great question. So I like to divide it because this I confuse people sometimes because I'm so hardcore about Bitcoin, but sometimes I'm talking about Bitcoin and sometimes I'm talking about risk assets in general, like stocks and things like that. So I like to separate all this. So I'll take it in stages. So why am I a bear? So the macro is ugly right now. We are clearly uh, in, a, in a, a period of economic slowing, right? GDP growth was negative in Q1. I think very much it's going to be negative in Q2. It's probably going to be negative. Q3 is kind of iffy. It, it depends because you compare it year over year. There's a chance it will be flat, but probably negative. We could be negative GDP Q4 and negative GDP uh, Q, uh, Q1 of 2023. So we could have like five consecutive quarters of negative growth. That's where you start getting concerned about, are we in a depression? Like this is crazy. And what if the growth just, we don't recover because we're in this sort of death spiral, this downward spiral, similar to what we had back in the, the 1930s. We could go into something like that. That's how serious this is. So I'm very bearish. And on top of that, we have the Fed tightening. So when you have the Fed being hawkish as the economy is slowing, that is absolutely horrible for risk assets. It's always horrible for risk assets. When I say risk assets, I mean stocks, Bitcoin. Bitcoin still trades like a risk asset, even though it's not. It's it's the ultimate risk off asset. But the world doesn't know that yet. The world still thinks of it like a crypto crypto, or they think of it like a small tech stock. They just do not understand that it's better money yet. So all of those things get hurt. It all comes down to things like liquidity and things. And if the banks can't function properly, they start to get concerned. They start to shore up their own liquidity. They protect themselves. And if banks aren't, if they're in protection mode, which they are right now, they don't want to loan money out. They don't want to lend to businesses or individuals. So people keep talking about, well, there's still high lending rates right now. That's because people are starting to draw on their revolving credit lines. They're getting desperate. They're charging on their credit cards right now. They can't pay for bills because inflation is so high that, you know, groceries are expensive, gas is expensive, all that kind of stuff. So as the economy is starting to slow down, we're seeing the, the, the signs of an early recession. Everything looks ugly, and I think it's going to get worse, much worse, before it gets better. And um, it could be terrible. So, so I haven't been this bearish. I'm normally an optimistic guy. I haven't been this bearish ever. Like I've never seen conditions this bad before, not in my lifetime, anyways. And I'm 47. So I'm concerned that unless we can find a way to finagle uh, out of this, um, that it could get very bad uh, in the coming months. So, but we'll see. So, what is the impact of that? Uh, risk assets. I still think that equities, they've fallen far. You know, the S&P is down like 20% ish. Uh, the NASDAQ is down 30% ish. It's actually, they've been up a little bit with this recent rally. I agree with you. I think it's just a standard bear market rally, meaning that they kind of fell too far too fast. Now we're having a bit of a recovery. All the optimists that come back out and they're saying, hey, we've bottomed, we're good. Then they're all buying back in. I think they're going to get smoked. I think we're going to go down again and it's going to go down hard still. I wouldn't be surprised if the NASDAQ went down another 30 to 50% from here. Um, the S&P 500, not quite that much, but like 20 to 40% from here. And this may grind on a little bit longer than most people are prepared for, because there's a lot of stuff to work out. When we started in December 2021, when we were at our peak in, in the equities markets, the price to sales ratio of the, of the stock market was the highest it's ever been, higher than 1929, higher than 2000, the dot-com bubble, higher than 2008. We have all of that excess bubble frothiness to get rid of still. And, the, and we are not going to, to bottom until all of that speculative fervor has basically completely died. And, and, all, you know, and all of the uh, optimism that we had turns into basically hopelessness. We're nowhere near the hopeless bottom yet. Uh, so that's why I still think we have further to fall with equities. Well, and then what I, would trigger that? What would trigger uh, the next that fall? fall? 
So I think so far what we've had is people have realized that growth is slowing and we're starting to, and we've had a multiple. So, so during a bear, uh, excuse me, a bull market when times are good and usually the Fed is doing QE kind of things, it, you know, the monetary supply is expanding those sort of things. What you have are multiple expansion. So meaning like if a normal price to earnings ratio of the stock market is 15, the price of the stock divided by the earnings is 15. That's kind of the average uh, multiple. In bull markets, it goes way beyond that. It gets up to 20, 25, 30. And it gets like, well, that's kind of, it gets kind of silly, but people think, well, we live in a different age now. We have the Fed supporting us. We have easy money. It's going to be like this forever. So that's a reasonable multiple to pay, to pay. You know, price to sales was the same. It got above three for the first time. And normally that's kind of in the one to two range. That's really high for a price to sales. So people are basically paying a ton of money today because they believe that these really good times are going to continue for a very long time. That's what we were starting from. We have to work through all of that. So the first part of the recession, I, I think we have two phases. Phase one, I think is probably over where we start to see a compression of those multiples. Phase two is because uh, of the earnings um, earnings themselves. So, so when we have this combination and Stan Drunkenmiller talks about these big three a, a lot, when you have high interest rates and you have high oil prices and you have a, a strong dollar, that is like deadly for corporations. So if you're a US corporation, you're, the dollar is so expensive, you can't sell your products internationally like you could before because people can't afford to buy as much as they could. Mm -hmm. um, interest rates are high. So you're trying to roll over your debt, but you can't because it's at much higher interest rates. So that's when you see like the zombie companies, if you've heard of those, they're, they're only surviving because the government was buying uh, their debt and allowing them to continue to roll over at these really low yep. rates. Now those are the rates are much higher. So when they have to roll over, they're gonna be like, I'm out, I fold, we can't do it anymore. So we're gonna see the collapse of lots of those kind of crappy companies. I'm sorry for my language, but that can't that um, should have died like 10 years ago and they've been hanging on. They're just gonna go away. And that's a good thing. That's creative destruction. They should go away because they they can't, they're not running a good business. And then, and then the high oil prices, that affects everybody. It affects consumers. It affects, you know, if, if you're just a normal person going to work or not, you, you, you might not be able to afford your gasoline. If you're a transportation business, if you're, I mean, I mean imagine FedEx and UPS and Amazon, they're trying to deliver and their, their cost of gas is, is double where it was a year ago. Airline prices, then they're, they're putting, passing on those prices to uh, consumers now. And so people are starting to second guess, should I really travel? Uh, my plane ticket literally went up like two and a half times from, to, to go from point A to point B. So all of those kind of things, when you have that factor, that means corporate earnings. So they can still make maybe decent revenues, but because of all of these higher input costs, their earnings are much lower. So why am I bringing all this up? The, um, the estimates for 2022 earnings was that they were going to be 10% higher than 2021. And I say that's just complete malarkey and hogwash, and there's no possible way they can do that. So I think as companies start to report here right now, we're in earnings season right now. So as they report what's going on, and as we see more companies report throughout the S&P 500, what we're going to see is those analyst estimates were too high. And so the denominator in the equation, price to earnings, that's actually going to come way down. And that pulls down the price with it, pulls down the price of the stock with it. So I think that's what we're going to see next is we're going to have uh, really um, uh, pessimistic earnings reports, earning the analysts are going to bring down their estimates. And so where people were saying, yeah, you know, if we just have a PE this high, then we should see the S&P 500 this high by the end of the year, that's going to ratchet itself way down, I think. And that's what we're going to see next. So phase two is when things get really ugly. Businesses start slowing down. Nobody's hiring anymore. Unemployment actually does rise. We will see inflation come down, by the way, but it's because our lives are being destroyed and businesses are being destroyed. Uh, and that'll bring down the equities markets alongside of it. And what about the housing bubble? Will that, as a result, pop as well? Because, I mean, the cost of the, the cost of housing that since 2020, I mean, I, I can't, I don't understand how anyone but like corporations can basically just gobble up these places to turn them into rental units. Right. Yeah, you have to be a BlackRock in order to be able to afford these kind of prices, right? But um, yeah, so housing already is rolling over for sure. Like, it, you know, mortgage rates are high. It costs like 50 to 100% more 
uh, to support a mortgage now based on the price you wanted to buy it. So, so everything across the residential housing market has clearly already started rolling over and that's going to continue to roll over. So I think people should absolutely expect by the end of this year, housing prices will be much lower. Uh, mortgage rates, I think actually mortgage rates will start to come down because I expect treasury rates to start to come down uh, as we go deeper into a recession. So that's a good thing. It will reset everything to a more healthy level. To your point, everything was really frothy and ridiculous and and it's pricing regular people out of the housing market, which is unfortunate. That's another thing that Bitcoin is going to fix, by the way, down the road. It's going to bring, bring things down to what they should be priced at, not what you know the central bank uh, pumps it up to be. Um, so yeah, I would expect real estate to roll over for sure. And I think that's going to get worse before it gets better if you're an investor. And it's going to get better if you're waiting to buy something, hopefully in six to 12 months. So when Bitcoin was in that 50,000, 60 range, there were so many people that thought, oh, we're going to 100K. I mean, I mentioned earlier, I was I was buying, I was like, oh, it's, you know, now the support level after it crashes is going to be 50. Because I always thought at some point it's going to come down, the balloon is going to, the bubble's going to burst. But I thought we would have ascended to higher highs. Actually, we would have had more of a blow off top and found support more around the 40, 50 range. Were you, were you at that 60,000 price saying, no, 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 I should, you know, we should be in kind of cash positions to have some powder to deploy later. Yeah. So confession time, I, I was fully uh, bullish uh, leading all the way through the end of the year. And it took me until early. Um, so basically it took me to the end of December to tilt neutral on Bitcoin and then uh, early January till I tilted bearish officially. But yeah, I was, I was right there with you. And so two things I think happened, by the way. So I think that Bitcoin was fully set up and was going to go parabolic. And we were starting to move to where things were really heating up, if you remember back in April, mm -hmm. May. And then what happened? China came out and they banned Bitcoin miners. That was like a legitimate, like kind of black swan event. And I say that because yes, China has banned Bitcoin in the past, but never like what they did this time. They're like, mm -hmm. Bitcoin miners are out. You have to get out of our country. And so the hash rate literally dropped in half, like almost overnight. And so the price clearly followed. So I think it was on its way up to go parabolic. And then instead it just crashed because of that. It, it was, uh, I think it bottomed around July ish, July 20th or something like that. And then it started to come up again. And I think it was making another run and it was going to go back up. I think it was going to head up to say hundred K or make that parabolic run higher that a lot of us were anticipating. And then though, what it did, because Bitcoin is the world's freest market, uh, you know, more than equities, more than bonds, more than commodities, all these other things, it sniffed out trouble under the economic hood before any of the rest of the markets did, any, before I did, before anyone did. The it canary in the coal mine. It was yeah. the canary in the coal mine. And so it figured that out on November 8th. That's when it peaked. And then it's been descending ever since then. Um, and so again, that's the, the upside of that. It will be, I think, the first to sniff out a bottom. And it will be first to sniff out when the economy is going from bad to less bad. And I think it will bottom and start to rise up before equities do and before most other assets do. So yes, so confession, I was, I was bullish all the way through 2021. I was wrong. Um, I didn't have... A, the same trading stop losses that I do now in my system. Had I had the system in place now, we would have stopped out at like 55,000 uh, and just been kind of watching it slide. Um, but but it is what it is to learn from our mistakes and and, yeah. and uh, get better every day. I know if we if we had a crystal ball, all of us would have you know would buy at every bottom and <laughs> exactly yeah. Um, so let's say I know that dollar cost averaging is the best advice for everyone, and you you know you capture. The, the, the benefits of sort of this volatility, if you will. But um, let's say someone did have a little bit more that they saved up and they really wanted to de deploy it most effectively. Do you think that right now is a good price or what, I mean, do you think that they should hold out for this true bottom? Yeah. So, well, first of all, I never got to that step three. I talked about the, the macro oh, yeah. uh, conditions. Two was the, what I think about equities. They have much further to fall still. Three is Bitcoin. Bitcoin has already taken, I think, the 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 um, bulk of the decline in already. It's already absorbed most of it. I don't know that we've bottomed, but it's possible that we have. And regardless, what I think is going to happen is that we kind of have this sideways bottoming pattern that lasts for a long time. So basically what I think is going to happen, I don't know that it goes much lower. It could it could wick down to 15,000 or wick down to 10,000. I think that will, won't last long. It will get quickly bought up and it will pop back up to kind of these levels. And so I think it's just going to kind of trend sideways while equities fall further. 
And then it's going to be really? the first to start going up and then equities will lag behind it and go like that. So that's what I think is going to happen. And that's similar to what happened, you know, back in 2018 and things too. It just kind of stayed in this bottom pattern for a very long time. Um, and I think while the economy is ugly and while, while liquidity is low it generally around the world, um, that Bitcoin, it can't really go up. There's just not enough liquidity to get into it right now. And so that's why I think it just sort of stabilizes. Um, but so to your point, don't try to pick tops and bottoms. I tell people that all the time. People waste so much of their lives trying to time market tops and market bottoms, and you can't do it. You can get lucky every once in a while, but for the most part, you can't do it. Learn instead to recognize value. So learn to recognize when a great asset is cheap and when it's expensive. And Bitcoin right now, based on all of the metrics I use, which is on-chain analytics, which is basically demand-based models, um, uh, network adoption models, the S-curve of adoption. When you look at things like that, Bitcoin is super, super cheap right now. Um, so I tell people, like, if you have high conviction, what I would do if you have high conviction about Bitcoin and you have, say, a, a lump sum of money and you want to get into it, I would put half of it into it today, just whatever price it is. It's, I don't even know what price it is, uh, 22 something, uh, 21 something. So yeah, put half of it in today and then dollar cost average with the other 50% over like the next six to 12 months or so. If you uh, have kind of lower conviction and you're nervous, but you think you want to start getting into it, don't do a lump sum right away. Just start dollar cost averaging today. So maybe you have $10,000 you want to put into it um, over the next year, you know, divide that up or, you know, and do like 800 bucks per month. Um, you know, there's lots of great programs to do that, by the way. I'm a big fan of Swan Bitcoin. I love what they do there. I love their education. They make it easy to do it. They, they teach people what to do. They teach people how to uh, put, put your Bitcoin into cold storage. I love everything about them. So I, I strongly recommend Swan to people for stuff like that. Well, for Bitcoin, it's easy to see it as an inflation hedge when you zoom out. But how do you defend Bitcoin as an inflation hedge right now in these circumstances? I will say that intentionally, the government and the federal bank have distorted what the term inflation means. And so that's why there's so much confusion about it. Most people just think um, costs of goods went up, that's inflation. But there are different ways to think about inflation. I think what Bitcoin does by design is it protects against monetary debasement. So fiat money by design, by its policy and protocol, it has to debase over time. They, they print more and more units, right? More and more dollars over time. So the value of each dollar approaches zero over time. Bitcoin is, flips that on its head. It's the antithesis of fiat currency. And because it has a scarce stable supply, the value of each individual unit approaches infinity over time. It's just kind of like basic math equations. That's what the design of Bitcoin is. That's why I'm such a, a huge fan of it. Um, inflation, so Bitcoin does not um, trade on the whims and the, and the rapid fluctuations of, of price uh, inflation. So consumer good inflation, the CPI, those kind of things. It is an absolute protector against monetary debasement, though. So over time, you have to look at what is the Fed doing? What are the central banks doing? Is the monetary supply of U.S. dollars and other fiat currencies uh, expanding, uh, then Bitcoin also expands in price. So the price increases when you see those times of periods. When you see periods of tightening, like we are, so the whole world, because of COVID, that sort of put the whole world, except for China, because uh, they're treating COVID differently, but the rest of the world is all basically on the same economic cycle. Right now, we're in a slowing economic cycle. And and all of the central banks, most of the world's central banks are tightening into an economic slowdown. That means that liquidity is drying up, it's shrinking, and Bitcoin feels that effect. And so Bitcoin price draws down. And so again, once we bottom and central banks start to expand again, I expect the price of Bitcoin to expand rapidly uh, at that point and make up for lost time. So like I said, it's it's based on the metrics I use, it has never been cheaper. Even though it's 22,000 or 21,000 right now, it's never been cheaper based on some on-chain analytics things that I use and the demand-based models this is a fantastic time to be loading up as much as you can be. Because I think two years from now, we're, we're going to be talking about six figure, six digit uh, Bitcoin, almost for sure. Like I feel very confident mm -hmm. in that. I could be wrong. I don't, you know, just my guess is, yeah. uh, but I think it's like a hundred thousand is kind of a no brainer and it's going to make up for lost time uh, after, after enduring these like one to two years of pain that we're going through right now. Do you think that they're going to end up having to pivot with inflation still pretty high and basically eventually get us into maybe even the double digits and negative interest rates? And what do you think? I mean, the people at the in the government, some of them are smart enough to understand what Bitcoin is. So do you think that they're kind of trying to, I don't know, prevent Bitcoin from from running 
as fast and as hard as it could? Or what do you think? I don't think they have any control over Bitcoin, which is what I love about it. It's uncontrollable and the Fed and the government can't stop it and the Fed can't really do anything. I think absolutely the Fed will pivot and I think it's going to probably come sooner than most people expect. I'm expecting sometime between August and December for the Fed to at least, when I say pivot, basically stop hiking and, and just say, okay, we're going to stop here and probably stop and wait and watch. The markets are going to slap them in the face and be like, you can't do this anymore. And so the more important things to watch are, you know, this, this, most people pay attention to stock markets, but I'm watching what the credit markets do. And um, I think we're going to see sovereign nations actually default uh, and it's going to be massive. And when you have major countries defaulting on their debt, um, uh, cause they can't print money, right? So if you're a smaller country and you're not the U S and these other major currencies without your central banks, you, you have no other choice, but if you can't pay your debts because the dollar is so strong and your currency is so weak and you have these huge debt payments you can't pay, you just have to default. You go into bankruptcy as a country. And we're going to see more and more of that happen, I think. And as that happens, that sort of freezes up and it wrecks the whole credit system and the bond market start to get wrecked and freeze and nobody wants to buy them. So you get a no bid uh, kind of action where meaning nobody wants to place a buy order. Um, that's a bad situation. That's what the Fed is most concerned about. So I think they're going to be watching that very closely. And the second they see signs that that the credit markets are freezing or locking up or going in, in the wrong direction, they're going to be forced to pivot. So regardless of what inflation is doing. Now, I will say, I think when that happens, things are going to be ugly. And so we're going to be in a recession. Unemployment is going to be going up. All of that stuff hacks. So the demand destruction model that the Fed is following right now, operation demand destruction, I call it. Uh, it's going to succeed and that will bring prices down for sure uh, in the short term, at least. But I, I think that we're going to have high inflation generally throughout this decade. It's going to be an ugly decade, basically, of a stagnant economy, um, choppy inflation for sure. Uh, but then we're going to have these massive deflationary busts kind of mixed in, in between. And I think that's what we're at the start of right now, where we go from high inflation to we literally within a couple of months could go to flat like zero or negative inflation. That's what happened back in 2008, 2009. Um, I'm watching the price of oil closely to see what happens. You know, oil had gotten all the way up into the 120s per barrel. Um, it could, and it's down below 100. It could fall down to 60 or 70 or so and just suck everything down with it. And we could get this big deflationary event. That's usually when people are totally panicked. Everybody is selling everything because they're so scared. That, that's when we'll bottom. And that's when the Fed will pivot at that point. And, and then uh, it'll be scary and nobody will want to buy. That, that'll be the time to buy. And especially that'll be the time to own a lot of Bitcoin. Well, I think a lot of people agree when the Fed does pivot, the amount of money printing that they're going to have to do the next round is going to be even more unprecedented, right? Um, I wanted to ask you, though, Fed Chair Jerome Powell, I recently learned that this guy is like very wealthy. I mean, he's got like 100 or $150 million. He does not need that position. And I'm sure he doesn't want to be the inflation fall guy. What the hell is his agenda? I, I don't like speculating. So first of all, you yeah, he came from private equity. The dude's a rich guy. He's an attorney, I think, by, by mm -hmm. trade or something, too. So how in the world these people get to be in charge of our country and, and the whole financial world is beyond me. But um, it's all politics and I'm not a fan of politics. So what's his agenda? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know why he's doing what he's doing. I don't know why they, they all have these these um they, first of all i think they're all constantly lying um and i'm not even like a conspiracy theory kind of guy but I, I listen to the stuff janet yellen says like she even just said like today or yesterday like oh there's no signs of a recession we're in great shape and i'm just like what are you talking about like you're insane and, you, and the reason why it bugs me so much is it's intentionally misleading people like i know what she's doing they want to like preserve the the ethos of you know americans like don't give up like we're gonna get through this we're not in a recession keep investing keep saving, you know, you know, and they're going to get destroyed though. And they're never held accountable for that. So it just drives me crazy. Um, I don't know why Powell's doing what he's doing. If I were him, I would bail, uh, you know, and I, I think it's, there's never, it's never been clear. There's never been better marketing for why the world needs Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Like, why do we have this group of random old rich people deciding the monetary policy for us and just causing these massive bubbles and then causing these massive deflationary busts that just absolutely destroy people. You know, it, it, it drives me nuts. Like, why wouldn't we just have a solidified immutable monetary policy where we know exactly what the, you know, the growth of the monetary supply is and it it expands using free market supply demand uh, economic forces that sets the price and nobody can change it because that's what the free markets do so i'm obviously 
vastly a, a way bigger fan of an automated plan like Bitcoin offers uh, than having these random people decide our fate. Well, to start to wrap up, how do you think the transition into this parallel system will actually play out? Because um, like I was rereading the other day, Jason Williams book, Hard Money You Can't F With. And it talks about how there's going to be these four stages of, you know, kind of like the fourth turning where at some point they're, they're going to appear to be very friendly and regulated. And yes, we like this, but then they're going to see how, how much it actually threatens their system and their power. So all of a sudden it's maybe going to be banned and then they're going to realize they can't really ban it. And so how do you think it'll play out? And do you think that that will come with some, I don't know, civil unrest, violence? I mean, potentially, you know, ushering in a new system, a little bit of chaos, I would imagine, because not everyone can just jump on the lifeboat because they're so behind at that point And Bitcoin has ascended to whatever the price is. Yeah. So first of all, to your to your latter point, I've been saying this for a couple of years that this is just it's going to be a tumultuous decade. It's going to be ugly. There's going to be lots of unrest. You know, income inequality has never been worse. Um, uh, um, people, the quality of life is going down for people because people can't even afford to pay for their groceries and pay their gas bills. So the people on the lower uh, echelons of the uh, economic uh, standards, they're getting hammered right now. They already work one job and now they've picked up a second job just to pay their basic their basic bills and support their family. They're thinking about, do I get a third job and when do I ever sleep and how do I see my family? You know, the, this is when life gets hard and when life gets that hard, people get desperate. And so that's when you start seeing things like coups and wars and, you know, people stealing and thiever, and thievery goes up. All this stuff, it's just, it makes for a really rough time. You start seeing governments get overthrown. We saw it in Sri Lanka recently, you know, and I, th I think we're going to see more, more of that kind of stuff to come this decade for sure. We're going to see the collapse of a lot of these smaller nations and their fiat currencies are going to, that purchasing power will get moved into the U.S. dollar the Chinese yuan and their kind of uh, enemies, excuse me, they're, they're friends. So, you know, we have the US side, the China, Russia conglomerate, and then into Bitcoin as well. So I think it's ultimately good for Bitcoin. So we have a lot of tumultuous stuff. I agree. I'm, I'm into the fourth turning co concept that Neil Howe presents. I think that's super interesting. And I think we actually are at kind of such a time. So I'm expecting ugliness. How will Bitcoin come out? I actually think hyper Bitcoinization is already underway. And I talk about that. It's not going to be an event that we see. It's 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 a process. It's sort of like saying the term hyper internetization. Like you wouldn't, you we weren't waiting for like this moment where the internet was here and because the day before it wasn't. It's not going to be like that with Bitcoin either. What we're seeing is this steady increase in adoption of Bitcoin users. We're seeing layer two get built out. We're seeing layer three get built out. Um, it's going to be ubiquitous, but we're not going to really notice it, even though it's all happening under our noses right now. You know, we have the El Salvador case, which made a lot of news, um, but we're just we're just seeing the proliferation of it going across all across the world right now. And to me, that's what hyper Bitcoinization is. It's it's inevitable. It's it's going to happen because it is better money for the world, even though a lot of wealthy Americans and other wealthy uh, people from around the world don't really appreciate it. They think of it as sort of, again, like a crypto or a speculative asset to maybe make money on. Other countries see it as a life preserver, right? They, they, this is their rescue boat. It's their ark. Their, 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 their whole lives purchasing power and saving is being decimated right now. So they're, they're frantically looking for some, some way to preserve their purchasing power and protect themselves and their family. That's where Bitcoin comes in. It was literally made for the plebs. And so they're going to come into it. They're going to transfer their purchasing power. And then suddenly when we get back into the good times again, so we're going to, like I said, I think it's ugly right now. It's going to get even uglier in the next couple of months. We will bottom then, and then at some point, life will get good again, at least for a, a couple of years or so, or the business cycle will turn back up again. People will put money back into risk assets again. I think at that point, Bitcoin explodes higher, and, uh, and the, those of us that have, uh, that have endured this uh, pain of the last year and a half or so uh, will be very rewarded, I think. You know, Jeff, I can talk to you forever. You're very articulate. You should be going on Fox News, I think, in my place. because You, <laughs> you do a great job, well. <laughs> by the way. I love your interviews. You, you do very, very well with us. So nice job. Well, I learned from people like you. Um, I know we're short on time, and I could even have another like hour-long conversation with you about just healthcare in addition to macro. But I kind of wanted to just ask you, because I really do think that our financial system has corrupted things like our food industry and our medical industry. So you know, I know that this is probably a nuanced topic, but how do you think Bitcoin could fix healthcare? Oh, man. Uh, well, first of all, I have a lot of, it, we could talk for many hours on this. I could blather on and on. 
healthcare has serious issues, right? It's, it's one of the stodgiest of the stodgy sectors. Um, things don't change at all in healthcare because there's such a powerful lobby. Uh, that's one of the reasons. The main thing that I think that needs fixing is price transparency. So nobody knows what anything costs in healthcare. Very few people do. There's a couple of people who are trying to be transparent. As a doctor, I had no idea what my patients were charged for anything that I did. Any procedure I did for them, uh, any scan, CT, MRI, they don't tell us. We have no idea. And it totally depends on what insurance do they have? You know, are they insured? Are they not? What is the deal that this insurance company has with this clinic or this hospital? That's what determines prices. And it's, it varies uh, in a city, in, a, in the same clinic, it's, it's different prices for different people, right? And so not, all of that stuff is crazy. So first of all, the easiest solution, the first thing to do would be to uh, institute price transparency. Like basically like this is what it costs and then in, introduce free market economics back into medicine. The insurance companies don't want that because they're very, very profitable based on the current models that we have right now. They love lack of transparency because that's an arbitrage opportunity. You can take advantage when people don't know what true prices are. They do. So they know what's cheap and what's expensive and they can arbitrage and they collect the profits on that opportunity. Um, the, I don't, I'm not a fan of any of that stuff. And so what Bitcoin does, anything Bitcoin touches, it uh, instantly uh, brings about an honest unit of accounting to, to any industry that it touches, any person that it touches, it forces you to be honest with valuations of things. So Bitcoin and healthcare, I think would be fantastic. One way, by the way, that I, I kind of encourage my friends, a lot of physician friends who have private practices and things, you can start right now by making a difference. You can literally just take 10% of the money you have on your balance sheet. You know, say you have your, your money that you, you pay your, your nurses and your techs and your other administrative staff with, put 10% of that into Bitcoin right now. You can go over to Swan, they can help you do that right now, or you know, I can help them do that. And that's one way to start getting onto a Bitcoin standard and to be able to take advantage of that. And you can start with a smaller amount of money because yes, it is volatile, um, but it's more volatile to the upside over time. And so I see I'm already, I'm already digressing too much. Healthcare desperately needs Bitcoin because it needs price transparency. It needs honesty. Uh, and what that would bring back, it would bring back the physician patient relationship. The best doctors would get paid the most for doing the best job. And the patients would be happy to pay them for doing such a great job and having high quality of care. The bad physicians would get winnowed out. The ones who are only doing it to make money and taking advantage of the fiat system and like, you know, Medicare fraud, those kind of things, they would get winnowed out. Uh, they wouldn't exist anymore. And it would just bring about a better healthcare system society for everybody. And we could focus more on staying healthy uh, instead of just treating disease like the healthcare system is focused on right now. So I have, I, I could talk for 10 hours on this, but I, won't. I, I love this. No, I would like to do maybe another episode or something, because I think this is fascinating. And I think, you know, we are the sickest nation in the world. We have the most obesity issues where we have like every person is taking between one and five drugs on average. And it's like, how did we get to be this way? So I would yeah. love to learn more. Um, but thank you so, so much for taking the time. Any just final takeaways given, you know, um, the Fed raising interest rates yet again, things are very volatile, just your final message or takeaway. Well, it's the same thing I said at the Bitcoin conference back in early April that I said, things are going to be ugly this year. And that 2022 is the year, it's a sat stackers paradise, right? So we're gonna have, I think, low choppy sideways price action for probably possibly the, the rest of 2022, take advantage of it. Like this is the time to be buying Bitcoin, to be increasing your stack because when it explodes on the other side of this, you are gonna get left behind in the dust. If you're waiting for some bottom, if you're waiting for 10,000 or 8,000 or whatever number you're waiting for, you risk the biggest opportunity cost of your lifetime. And I truly believe that and mean that. Don't miss out, like at least own some Bitcoin because at some point when it takes off, it's gonna be, it's gonna be life-changing. So um, it's gonna stay, it's gonna be ugly for a while. Don't, don't get bored out of Bitcoin. Don't get like frustrated because it's only going sideways. It's not gonna stay like this forever. So um, take advantage of the low prices while we have them. Perfect, thank you so much, Dr. Jeff Ross. And where can people find you? Uh, two places. So I'm always on Twitter. My handle is uh, at Valeshire Cap. Um, I'm on there way too much probably. Uh, um, so you can come check me out there. Or um, if you want to learn more about how I invest, I obviously do things pretty differently than most investment advisors and financial planners. Uh, you can check out Valeshire.com or even shoot me an email. If you just send it to info at Valeshire.com, that will come directly to me and I'll respond to you if you're interested in learning about how I do investment services. And when are you writing your book? <laughs> Uh, no time. <laughs> no time. <laughs> no time for well, that. Thank you so much.